Hello, and welcome to Living a Culture of Life by Human Life International. I'm your host, Colleen, and I'm joined today again by Dr. Pat Fagan. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Pat. It's good to be with you again, Colleen. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show. And today we're going to be discussing something that you brought up in our, one of the previous episodes when you were originally on the show talking about fatherhood. And in that episode, you said that children have a right to the marriage of their biological parents. And I just thought that was a really interesting topic that seemed like there's a lot to unpack. So I wanted to have you back on the show to talk about it some more. Can you just start by explaining what you mean by that and how you got to that conclusion? Well, um, I gradually came to that conclusion over almost 40 years, uh, being a therapist, then being in the public discourse on marriage, family, sexuality, abortion, contraception, out of wedlock births, all the things that can go wrong and how things go right. Mm -hmm. And it, it probably was about 10 to 12 years ago that I first articulated that publicly, the right of the child to the marriage of his biological parents. And it's actually when you unpack it, it makes lots of sense, but we become so used to broken familyness that even stating that, look, every child ever born and ever to be born universally always through all time has the right to the marriage of the man and woman who brought him or her into existence. That holds for everyone. Now, will that right always be upheld? No. Can it always be upheld? No. But is it present? Yes. And when it's violated, it's a serious violation of a fundamental universal human right of every child. And the big violators are the parents. Okay. They're violators of fundamental human rights. What about all of those situations, like cases of rape or cases where the parents aren't married and maybe he seems abusive or she would be like not emotionally ready, like all the hard cases that come to mind? How do you respond to those? Because if the children have a right to this marriage, what does that mean in those situations? Well, human rights are violated all the time. Mm -hmm. um, family rights are violated all the time by husbands of their wives, by wives of their husbands. Um, and these are essentially, those violations also are sins. Like <laughs> They go hand yeah. every every serious violation is a sin. So the right of the child cannot always be upheld. You take the case of rape. Mm -hmm. Clearly there, the child has a right to life and the good mother will bring the child to birth but she is under no obligation to marry the man, even though that child has the right to that marriage. But you can see almost immediately, but in this case, that never can be. So it's not like a right that supersedes like the child's right to just be in a safe home. It's, or like, in a sense, like his right to life. No, it it's... does. It supersedes that. Uh, but common sense kicks in. It's a fun, you see, the fundamental universal human rights cannot be superseded. Okay. Or they're not universal and they're not fundamental. But and in that case, is, why would it be moral for the woman not to marry the rapist? Because of the, it's now a call of prudence. And the safety and good of the child requires the mother to protect her, her child from this man. Okay. And to protect her. And that's, that's basic common sense. Yeah. Sure. That, that the very notion of rape mm -hmm. is a massive violation of the mother and so, in turn derivatively a massive violation of the child. So in a sense, the violation has already occurred and yes. now you're trying to help the child grow up in a safe, loving home. Yes. You're now dealing okay. with the realities that have confronted. You can get other cases, um, mm -hmm. you know, two teenagers young teens get sexually involved, a one night stand, and there's a baby there. Now they ought to be able to deliver the marriage, uh, their marriage to their child. But anybody looking at this case is say, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is not gonna happen. You know, it's not good here. So this is where the child's right cannot be fulfilled. So are you saying that the child has a right to be conceived within marriage? Exactly. Okay, that's the difference. That's where I was getting stuck because it seemed like you were saying, it, I was taking as once the child's conceived, the parents should get married. 
But it makes sense when you say that the child's conception itself should happen within marriage. Exactly. And okay. that's that that's a very clear way of putting it. And actually it leads into one of the most practical aspects of this, that um, this is particularly true of Christian parents and actually all good parents uh, who uh, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, anybody who has a proper conception of marriage, of love, of children and of family, immediately their children become fertile. Immediately, the girl in her early teens or just around there uh, passes through Menarch, mm -hmm. and the boy uh, now has seed, and he is now fertile. From that moment on, the parents ought to be tutoring the child. Like, this is a massive power. This is one of the greatest powers God has given you to bring to life a creature in cooperation with God, who's going to last for all eternity. Mm -hmm. Now, that's huge. That ought never to happen except in marriage. And this is where then virginity till marriage becomes very important. We have lost that. And even as Christians and Catholics in the United States, given the movies we see and the amount of out of wedlock births, and even the pro-life movement, never talks about this because it doesn't want to damage or be hard on the good mother who saved the baby is a single mother and is bringing the baby to life and to term. God bless her. And we want yeah, to keep blessing her. It's this fine line of obviously not saying that the act that conceived the child was good, but at the same time, not condemning the mother so she feels pushed to abortion. And I think it's a very tricky line that people don't always know how to walk of how can you say that children should be conceived within marriage, but at the same time, help women choose life for their children, because obviously the child growing up in a single family home is better than the child being killed in the womb. Exactly. But you say both. You don't stop saying one because the other is good. Mm -hmm. you, you have to say both. And it actually comes back, what this is really bringing into focus is the fundamental at the biological, existential, human history, evolution, call it whatever you like, from the grandest perspective possible, the whole point of sexual intercourse, the ultimate point of sexual intercourse, is the begetting of the child. Now, people are going to immediately come in and say, you know, even fervent Catholics are going to say, oh, no, no, you also have, you know, the good of the parents, and that's there. But mm -hmm. ontologically, metaphysically, Sexuality is there for procreation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's through all the animal kingdom and a massive amount of the plant kingdom. This is the way God has made the sexes. And he's made the sexes for the future of whatever organism you're looking at. And, of course, the highest one is man. Well, you've got angels, but they don't. They, they never conceived. They were <laughs> instant and, <laughs> and each one unique. But for us, the sexual and marriage are coterminous. And the world really needs it. We've lost sight of this. So a good way then actually to get this discourse on the intimate connection between marriage and sexuality is to raise this issue, the right of every child to the marriage of the parents. That's a whole new shtick, if you want to put it, in this discourse that is robust and it's going to lead to all sorts of uh, discussion, just like the one one we're having yeah, now. Exactly. Can you then expand on that a little bit of why you like why children have the right to being conceived within marriage? What benefits it gives the child, and why growing up in a single parent? I think it's pretty. A lot of people who know something about this will know it's obvious, but I think it's important to talk through some of those points just so people understand. Oh yeah. I, well, one of the things that led me to it was after I had left the clinical work where it was fundamental, actually. It was in the clinical work I first began to see it. Way back when I was a young man, a young psychologist, um, half of my initial work was with children in mid-childhood, about four to age eight, vast majority. It was somewhere in there, referred by pediatricians or general practitioners who said, look, Pat, would you have a look at the kid? Something wrong here. I, I know it's not medical. I, I'm pretty certain it's psychological. That was the way most of the referrals came. 
uh, for those cases. That led me into dealing with children. Then that led me into marital therapy, uh, family, and family led me into marriage. You can't get away from. So what I realized, actually, and by the third year when I was working, I wouldn't see the kid till I could see the whole family from the beginning. In the beginning, I used to see the kid alone. You have the mother, and then I'd get together. By the third year, uh uh-uh, that was verboten, because you wanted to keep the focus off the kid and not make everybody in the family think, oh, this kid has a problem, because that's only going to make it even worse, (laughs) you know? Um, So I brought in the whole family, including dad, would insist on father being there. Frequently, he had to get away from work, but I'd insist. I wouldn't see the kid unless the father would come. And I remember one father, it only happened once, objecting. And I said, look, is this my child or your child? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're not going to take care of your kid, I'm not going to take care of him for you. I had to be tough. <laughs> they had to give him a bit of a kick. And he he broke and he came and he was delighted afterwards that he did. Why? Well, here's what happens actually when you keep here's the way the sessions went by my third year. Bring the whole family in, and then you just start talking how family life is going. And it was great if I had a three-year-old, because three-year-olds can speak, but they haven't learned to filter what they say. So the three-year-old would be very expressive of all the different things that are going on in the family. So you got a sense of the family dynamics, what was going right and what was going wrong much quicker. Actually, the three-year-old was a great help to the parents. It shortened the therapy by quite a bit. Um, but once I had a sense of what was going on in family life, and almost always there was tension between the parents that was causing the dysfunctional and the rest of the family, I'd break off after a while and say to the parents, let's leave the kids at home next week and the three of us just get together. And they always said yes. Everybody always said yes to that. Then I'd start working on building exploring with them where I already had the sense of they didn't have their act together. They were in disagreements, working on those, bringing about unity. And in 95% of the cases, I never had to do a thing with the child. Mm. Never. All the symptoms disappeared. The anxiety, the depression, the acting out, the boisterousness, whatever, disappeared in the kid once mom and dad got together. Now that, or got their act together, they were already together, but when the unity and the happiness was restored in the marriage. That was the beginning of what I said 12 years ago, I articulated the right of every child to the marriage of the parents, because there you could see, I could see, the child needs the marriage for the child to thrive. Mm. And when the marriage isn't there, or the marriage is going wrong because of selfishness or ignorance or whatever is the cause, the child wilts. He Mm -hmm. thrives on the good marriage of the parents and he wilts. And so the child could actually say, and I wish, and many kids almost express this when divorce is coming about. Mm -hmm. You owe me your marriage. Without it, I'm not going to become the person I could be. And all the data, this is where the years in public policy using the social science data, sociological U.S. federal surveys illustrate this time after time again. On every outcome measured as a group, children in intact families do better on every single thing Mm -hmm. than all the other family forms, divorced, remarried, adopted, the whole lot. Um, But single parenthood is a massive drain on the capacity of lots of the children. There are... There are always situations where heroic mothers pull off something massive and heroic. Uh, But it's not the way it's meant to be. And even those heroic mothers, if she had a heroic husband with her, the product would be even better still. The kids will be off the charts. So we all actually, and then what that comes back to is we all thrive when we belong with those around us. For you at HLI, when you come into the office in the morning, if people say hello and they're warm and all the rest, life is what you, you're welcome. You feel at home. Yeah. Imagine if you were to come in and somebody looks at you and then has a sour face and walks away or leaves you alone. Or Now, that will be impossible at HLI, given the people that are there. But people experience sometimes that sort of thing at work, and yeah. it's always disturbing. 
We thrive when we belong. And of course, the ones we need to belong to most, and we cry out for are our father and our mother. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about it? <laughs> what do we do about, as you, like you said, we have gotten very used to single family homes and all of that in today's world. Where do we go from here helping parents have their marriages succeed so that their children can thrive or encouraging women, young men and women to save sex for marriage and then help that marriage thrive? Well, that's a lifetime work involving <laughs> a zillion different things, but we can get to some of the fundamentals mm -hmm. where things have gone wrong and they have to first get right in the church because we have the grace, we have the doctrine, we have the sacraments, we have the support. Um, and if Catholics don't get this right, the rest of the world hasn't got a snowball's chance in hell. And it's almost literally the case um, of a snowball's chance in hell. The fundamental practical virtue in the interior life, but in society at large as well, at both these levels, in the depth of the soul and out in society, fundamental virtue practically it's not the most important, but it is the most fundamental, is chastity. Violations of chastity wreck the interior life. You got to go to confession. You got to start again. You probably, you know, and of course, they wreck the lives of kids and marriages. It's fundamental. And our society has become, you know, sex soaked and absorbed and increasingly dysfunctional and increasingly bizarre manifestations of it as we move away from that fundamental Christian, and it is Christian, is deeply Christian, mm -hmm. a virtue of chastity. Now, other good religions have it, but none to the same extent and depth as developed in the church. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where, that's where it comes. And this is why I say when the teenager or when the girl reaches Menarch and the boy reaches fertility, the father has to be tutoring his son. Look, son, the only place for you to use this power is in marriage. And that's why I want you to find a beautiful, great girl as quickly as you can. So you better learn and learn how to earn money and get a good job so that you, you can woo the most gorgeous, virtuous girl and then have a great time with her in bed as your wife and bring children into the world. You will have a thousand times more intercourse than children. And that's the way God has made it. That's the two benefits, as it were, of, of marriage, the fundamental one of the child, but with that, the great one of the closeness and the enjoyment of each other. Um, and the father wishes that for his boy. And if he's a good father and is close to him, and that's what we, that's what's all about in the father-son course, how mm -hmm. a father can pull that off. But the parallel is happening with the mother. She's tuning her daughter into sexuality. Once she reads Menarch, it is now the mother's job to tutor her daughter to be a great sexual being. We don't say that to our mothers. We don't say that to our wives. That doesn't come out in marriage prep. It ought to, because this, this is how you hand off the baton to the next generation, the baton of life. This is how the next generation really kicks in. And it takes tutoring and guidance and insight and all the rest to get a great young guy and a great young woman together, hopefully as virgins at the altar, ready to start their life. If you have that, if you have a couple like that at the altar, imagine what's going on with the parents. You know, we're on two sides of the church. You got the bride side, the the, uh, the groom side, and mom and dad on both sides. What you really want are two sets of parents who are delighted with what they see happening. Great guy marrying a great girl. Mm -hmm. A great girl having wooed <laughs> the way women woo. They're, they have their own way of doing it. It's the guy who's got to do all the overt stuff, but the women know how to catch, good, catch a good guy. So that's a huge problem today, too, for another talk. Um, but that you women don't those... know how to catch good guys or that there aren't good guys. No, no, actually there's a, with the, with 
with chastity and the whole proper sexuality gone out of culture, the wooing that's natural within good cultures is all broken down. We no longer have cultural patterns that help young people get together. And I know, and you must know, Washington is full of great young men and great young women who don't know how to get together. Yeah, And they're absolutely. growing old, they're growing into their 30s, all wanting to be married, but not able to find anybody. And here you got a bunch of great guys and over there, you got a bunch of great girls. And the culture has broken down and the patterns of courtship that were natural are gone, blown to smithereens by the pill, essentially, mm -hmm. and all that it has unleashed. Um, so the whole sense of chastity, which is a very positive virtue, actually, the chastity is the necessary, or it's the strong ingredient that can lead into a great marriage. When chastity broke down, and the, the data on this is rather interesting. Mm -hmm. A girl who has had two sexual partners prior to her husband is likely to 50% of them will divorce. Wow. With two prior to mm -hmm. husband. With one, it'll drop down to about 60, 65%. Mm -hmm. And with two, it'll drop down to about 50. And then it plateaus. Three, four, five doesn't seem to make too much difference in the aggregate as we look at it nationally. Mm -hmm. And this data has been, um, I verified it three, four times, and others have taken it up. Brad Wilcox has a wonderful charts of the Institute for Family Studies. You can see the mm -hmm. same thing. His, his is the reverse of that, but uh, the, the same data, the same thing. Chastity is absolutely key to strong society, strong marriage, strong families. And actually, and this is the part that I love hearing because I love digging deep into the data and the social sciences. Those who have the best sexual intercourse, virgins when they marry, who worship weekly. That's wow. the data. Now, the world out there is not telling us this at all. No. U.S. federal data, there's only one where you can dig down deep into it that has gone so deep in. It's the Lauman study that came out to about 20 years ago uh, that has dug really deep into that. There are lots of other indications, but that one just really nails it. Mm -hmm. um, so the if you come back, the right of the child... Actually, we could extend it further. Every child has a right to a chaste society. Mm. If he has a right to the marriage of his parents, then society has an obligation to the child. And you can see it without that chastity. We're aborting, what, about one-third of our kids? Yeah. Each year? And then the amount of out-of-wedlock births those kids who make it to life, mm -hmm. only 46% are going to reach age 17 in an intact marriage. Yeah. Like we have, uh, we have stopped knowing how to raise kids as a society. And all the West is going out of existence. All mm -hmm. across the developed West, the OECD countries, that's an organization of econ economically developed countries. Mm -hmm. These are all the strong economies around the world. They're called OECD. Every single one of them are way below replacement. They're going out of existence. The poor one that's going out of existence fastest, I think we talked about this before, is South Korea. Last mm -hmm. year, the latest data, South Korea only had 0 0.7% or 0 0.7 children per couple. Wow. I have, I've heard about Japan. I didn't realize South Korea was one as well. Well, South Korea is the basket case in the world, much okay. worse than Japan. Japan is in deep doo-doo because it's been, it's been uh, very low much, much longer. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing is that South Korea has become increasingly Christian. Now, the fertility rates among Christians are higher, but they're mm -hmm. still below replacement. Mm -hmm. And people say, you know, it's, it's the economy and it's very expensive to raise kids. Well, it's always been expensive. But our economies are much more productive. We're much wealthier 
than our ancestors were. We're much more comfortable. But people said, but we, we don't have enough money to have kids. Something's True. wrong there. But also when people lived in more farm-centered communities, they couldn't afford not to have kids because they needed multiple, like everyone working on the farm and all the hands. So I think I, like, even though it's always been expensive to have kids, I think there was, in a sense, an economic incentive for families pre-industrial revolution to have 10 children. Well, there were many people in the cities who weren't living on farms who had large families too. Now, That's true. look, when people have large family, and it's easier, actually, mm -hmm. It's easier in a village. It's harder to have large families in metropolitan. You take a large family in metropolitan New York and Manhattan. You know, how you can't you drive raise... a 12 passenger van down the street there. <laughs> yeah. But I can tell you, I know Paul Witz, who's probably well known. He ra he and his wife, both of them university professors, raised a large family in an apartment building in Manhattan. Wow. Not far from, they were professors at New York University. It can wow. be done, but it's much more difficult. And they are two extraordinarily bright and dedicated people. And it seems like a self-perpetuating problem because I think that a lot of the younger generations are cynical about marriage and getting married and having children because they've grown up seeing their parents' generation all have marriages fall apart. So they're watching. Like, well, we've got to be no... careful. They, not all marriages fall apart. Okay. Yeah. A lot but for of those them, whose parents did, that's devastating for but them. Even, even people whose parents, their marriage like did work out, they're still seeing yeah. many couples who have had that happen. So I guess when I say all, it's more that there's been such a large percentage since the sexual revolution of marriages that end in divorce, that younger generations, even if they come from a stable family, don't have the hope that you might have had 70, 80 years ago because they've seen such a high percentage of marriages end in divorce. And, and then they don't want to get married and have kids because they're afraid of divorce. That's because they're absorbing the norms and the themes and the memes of our society at large. Mm -hmm. If they it's... want, if they want to have a good marriage, they better find a community within which they're going to find it and be able to build it. And more and more people are just by common sense almost beginning to do that. You see mm -hmm. clusters of families who want kids coming together in neighborhoods, around different churches, um, young young professionals seeking the others through the help of churches. Mm -hmm. If you want a strong and happy future, you have to associate with those who know how to have a strong and happy future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you go off among those who are going to, you know, do all sorts of crazy things with sex, booze, and drugs, and, mm -hmm. you know, the screens and just the good life and pleasurable life, and you expect to find happiness there, well, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. It's understandable, but that's still crazy. So you have the course, the father-son course that you mentioned before. How does that fit into this whole conversation? Well, the key thing is actually when family breaks down and the one who's inclined to be more unchaste, easier and quicker is the boy. It's just the way God has made us. You know, the, the boys, what they go through at puberty is quite the change. And for instance, the amount of ideas, the sexual thoughts that come because of all the hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. Boys have a, you know, quite a path to, do, to trod to stay chaste and learn how to grapple with this. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the father is potentially the strongest link in the family or mm -hmm. the weakest. And what the father-son course is, so you, you, fathers learn how to raise boys who are going to be strong men, great sexually, great as husbands, great as fathers, and with full knowledge and competence in the sexual, where the sexual is not going to dominate them, they dominate their sexuality and know how to use it and uh, have a good life and a very mm -hmm. satisfying sexual life. That takes a lot of training and a lot of tutoring. And the father mentoring his son is what the course is all about. We've got six modules or six basic lessons. Mm -hmm. The first one is essentially becoming attached to your child. And the sooner you begin that, the better. And there's a whole module on that. And uh, then the second one is assuming you're attached. Sorry? Oh, I was about to ask, is that like how like the exchange of pheromones? I believe you mentioned this on the last 
podcast and um, Dr. Joe Malone mentioned it as well. If a child, if a father's holding his child, there's like a pheromone exchange that helps the father bond with the child and helps the child bond with the father. Is this what you're talking about with becoming attached? Well, that's that's a very good beginning. And okay. and actually, it's a, I think it's a very important moment to capture because a phenomenal bonding, we now know this from the research done, a phenomenal bonding can happen if the father catches that critical period. Okay. Um, but it's not just for them. Actually, bonding and affection is a key dynamic that the father has to cultivate through all the years of his children growing up. And even after they've left him, you know, we yeah. all, yeah. Um, and then the grandchildren. But so bonding means love, affection, uh, and showing it. Mm -hmm. Then the second big task the father has, it begins around three, four, mm -hmm. is spotting the talents of his children. And uh, where his son is concerned, spotting them, the sort of things he likes doing, the sort of things he seems good at, mm -hmm. catching him, doing it. And letting him know, letting the father letting his son know he delights in seeing his son do that. Why? Because it's from his father's delight that the son gets the sense of, ah, I'm, I, I'm manly. Mm -hmm. My dad delights in me. And the boy who gets that from his father now has a self-confidence anchored in reality. That's why the father tracks to see what he's good at. That... Um, with that, he can then go out and risk and grow and take things on. Mm -hmm. Learn how to take on a difficult job, take on the hard work of learning skills, and then take on the dangerous work of wooing a girl because he might get rejected, but he's still going to go for her. You know, yeah. faint heart, never won for a lady. And that's it. You don't want to raise a son with a faint heart. You want to raise a son with a strong heart who's, oh, okay, I risk everything. She's worth it. <laughs> Oh, if she says no, well, I'll find another even better girl. That's, that's the sort of son you want to raise. That comes from that second phase or that second big task, starting around, you know, once the child starts playing and expressing himself. And different kids do it in totally different ways. And the thing that he does well is likely the thing that as a professional later on, he's going to enjoy doing and be able to earn more money than doing anything else and mm -hmm. be able to support his wife and family. So then the third big thing is the father's and the mother's marriage. Mm -hmm. That teaches the children more about sexuality than anything else. Even though it's not overt, but the happiness, and gradually kids will know where it's all coming from, and mm -hmm. parents learn how to express their love for each other, they might keep the, their bedroom sacred and nobody gets in, uh, definitely never gets in without knocking on the door and maybe never gets in that sacred space. After, after a while, the teenagers begin to realize, oh, yeah, that's why the door is always closed. <laughs> but, and the expression of love in the family, actually the creation of a home that's happy, which means a marriage that's happy, uh, is the great work both parents have to do. For that to happen, the father has to be very dedicated to his wife mm -hmm. and then she to him. So that's the third big area of work. The fourth and the fifth, actually, modules are transmitting the sexual. And it's what you do prior to puberty and after puberty. Prior to puberty, you take boys. Boys aren't all that interested in girls pre-puberty. -pre but they do have questions, and they have questions about babies and the, eventually about sex. All they want is the information. So the parents are savvy, and they learn how to pass on the information in a good way and to keep that information seeking and exchange open mm -hmm. uh, so the kid can always come, boy or girl, the girl to his mother, the boy to the father. Now, in order to come for that, you can see how the bonding and the affection the father has with the child, with his son, and delighting in his son, all of that's going to make this exchange about matter sexual much easier. If that's not there, sex is too anxiety provoking for both the father and the son. They tend to avoid it. And then actually once puberty hits, then the we're into this very different area we've already talked about where the mm -hmm. father begins to tutor his son in being a sexual being. 
on chastity, on prayer, on struggle, on how how the dad protects himself. Every father today has to protect mm -hmm. himself sexually. How does he do it? How does he avoid pornography? How does he deal with sexual temptations? You know, mm -hmm. and he, he reveals enough that the boy really learns and, and admires that. And this actually is where Catholic fathers have such a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's going to confession, Catholic mothers too, where mm -hmm. boys see, without knowing anything of the content, and I'm not saying that fathers should reveal the content of confession to their kids, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we have the seal of confession, and not even the priest can bring it up, so you definitely don't want your kids bringing it up. <laughs> I know. But just the a child seeing their father go to confession is the huge lesson of constantly starting again yeah. and returning to God and getting closer to God and saying sorry for the sins because we all have faults mm -hmm. um, and starting again. So the pre-puberty and post-puberty are the two big trainings in being a sexual being. And then the last module we had came about actually uh, from doing the first five. And we realized, wait now, the shortcut to all this if a dad wants a shortcut, play with your kids the way the kid wants to play. Huh. It takes massive generosity. It takes time. And all these other things will almost have to happen automatically. A dad who cheerfully gives as much time in playing to his with his children is going to give all the rest. And, of course, playing with his wife. <laughs> yeah. I heard something... Oh, I'm going to get the details wrong, but I was reading a book um, recently with child development and they were talking about synapses that build in the brain as a child, like learning to do something. And normally it takes like, they have to do it like a certain number of times before that connection forms in their brain. And apparently what could take, I don't remember the numbers. I want to say like a hundred to 200 repetitions normally only take like a much smaller number. I want to say it was under 10 when it's done within play. So just like, oh, just from yeah. a child's development yeah. that, you need the play to be able to form those connections. It's the shortcut. And so it's yeah. so interesting that it's also the shortcut here. That's like the second time in a week that that's come up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the well, necessity of play. Yeah. Well, the delight, actually, you know, we're, we're all hoping that heaven is nothing but play. <laughs> right. <laughs> in one form or another, you know, uh, even like good conversations essentially are play, you know, where you're exploring with another, but it's best even, you know, occasionally, when, even if you're in deep metaphysical discussions, it's good to have a joke every now and then. Oh, you know, yeah. we, need, we need play, you know. Yeah. Um, and being with God, I'm sure a massive amount of it is is play. Um, yeah, play is, actually, play is loving. To play, deliberately play yeah. is, to, is to love, yeah. is to give love in a very practical, delightful way. That is totally unembarrassing. The others don't even know it's love. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's that's the course in a nutshell. Um, and it's we've made it. All the reports we're getting back. This may sound like self praise, but we've been. It isn't actually. As we got the course online, we were very. Uh, one we we did our very best, and we were looking for the feedback. What did we pull off? Everybody, some experts, some of the national experts on transmitting this stuff. Just today, one lady, mm -hmm. I won't mention her name because I don't have her permission, but and she's she's going to, but she said, Pat, it's so well done. And now I want to go through the whole thing with my <laughs> husband. <laughs> and she's a nationally known expert already on all these things and is an expert in family. Yeah. Another young parish priest has said it's absolutely fantastic. Another parish priest and the feedback from fathers who've been taking it. So we think we've pulled off something that we're hoping will make a huge difference. And actually, it'll help fathers get together with other fathers. Actually, we do it. The best way to do it is a, a small group of fathers doing it together. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Can I show a little bit of that? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Let me share screen on something here. And see if I can get it. Now, we can watch the trailer here from the beginning. I think if you have the type of relationship no. with your son where he will come to you, that's the key measure of success. Fundamentally, this course answers the question, in the midst of a sexually toxic culture, 
How do I raise my children to sexually flourish? The biggest thing that you can do for your children's sexual education is to nurture your marriage and to really pour into it, to develop a good, solid marriage that the children would want to emulate in the future. Every child, from the moment of conception, if they could speak, could rightfully say, you father, mother, you just brought me into existence. For me to become the adult I'm capable of becoming, I need your marriage. Even if your principles are right, I don't think they're going to stick unless you have the right culture at home. Raising a good, healthy son who's ready for marriage is not about techniques. It's about having a quality of relationship with your son where he can flourish in his human capacities. The real danger is not a dad who makes mistakes. The real danger is a distant dad, one who checks out. So stay involved. There is no more noble cause in your life as a father than the flourishing of your son, the development of your son, the bestowing of your son's masculinity. And the question is, do you have the courage? Because it's going to hurt. But do you have the courage? That's the trailer. And... Uh, um the what we've done with the modules and i'll show maybe a little bit is that all of those people and there is one other person mm -hmm. we have extensive interviews with them <clears throat> excuse me they're all experts um and all have raised good families as well but we have extensive interviews with them and then depending on the topic we slice and dice them so there's mm -hmm. each module has about 20 to 25 minutes of mm -hmm. these people talking about, you know, module one, the bonding, the next one about agency, developing that capacity and that uh, mm -hmm. confidence, then about the marriage, then about the sexual talks, and then about play. Mm -hmm. So we have, it's interesting, we pulled off something interesting. And then you've got that 20 minutes of that sort of teaching. And then we have a 10 to 12 page little booklet on that topic where you can dig deeper and discuss in the course with all sorts of questions to prompt you to figure out what's the one thing you as a father could start doing. Just one mm -hmm. small area, begin the journey of being a great father, but do it on a practical, immediate thing. Uh, so we've got those sort of questions and then lots of discourse. And there's six modules of those. Maybe I can show one of yeah one of those. Yeah. yeah go ahead that they can see me as this consistent leadership presence that they can trust that they want to listen to that when they listen to it it leads to good outcomes for them and so you know like i love golf i love golf i don't play much golf uh i love basketball i love tennis i love movies i love a lot of things that i don't do a lot of because generally that would require me to be outside the home, not with my kids. They are my hobby. Uh, they are my project. They are my delight. They're the most challenging thing I've ever had to do and the most rewarding thing I've ever had to do. And I've just decided that their flourishing is worth it. It's worth all the sacrifice. It's worth all the risk of saying no to all these other things in order to prioritize them and, and to be around them. So how do I do that? It's just boring stuff. I mean, it's it's going to the grocery store together and again instead of turning on that podcast or turning on music Gracie and I are just talking and 99% of the conversation with an 11 year old is pure nonsense there's nothing productive that comes from it but there's that 1% where she'll say that one thing that I go ooh we can we can talk about that or I'm going to make one comment about that and probably the most significant thing I try to teach my kids in terms of very being very intentional about it is how to extend and receive forgiveness how to uh, admit when you have been wrong and to to do something about that and that starts with modeling for me i blow up at my kids way too often i lose patience with them a lot i say things that i go man i can't believe i just said that you know that's a seven-year-old what are you doing pete and when those moments happen i sit down with them we look each other in the eye and i say i'm sorry that i did this i should not have done that and then the key thing for me and for us is you have to ask for forgiveness. Say, so, 
will you forgive me? And then they, they say yes, we, we hug, and we move on. So to be the primary educator of a child in sexuality means being the one who's really teaching them what it means to be a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, what it means to be married, the, the plan that God has for our bodies and our sexuality. And to be the primary educator of your child is to be the one who is first and foremost teaching them those things, both by your life and example, and also through your words and explanations of what they see in your own family and then also in the wider culture where they're going to be receiving messages that are going counter to that primary teaching. So basically you're using this course to help the parents' marriage thrive because children have that right to be conceived within marriage and therefore they kind of, you need to be able to help that the parents' marriage be the best possible. And this is helping the man kind of pull his weight within the marriage. Is that kind of what the course is for? Well, it's for that and a lot more. Actually, if you look at everything that's involved in the course, it's all about the husband loving his wife, the wife being loved and loving the husband, and together they're loving their children. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that's the biggest part of what life is all about. Mm -hmm. And a good society has that as its prime central function. Everything else is serving that. Mm -hmm. um, the whole should purpose. Be. Yes. And, yeah. and of course, we're also serving that this is our way to heaven. And actually, mm -hmm. heaven is the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all belonging to each other eternally, deeply. Mm -hmm. And we're made in their image and likeness. And you can see that in family life when it is full of love. It's an mm -hmm. attempt to that. And that's what all of existence is all about. The good society, the good couple, the good neighborhood, the good mm -hmm. family, the good church, the good nation is full mm -hmm of families where this is going on. So the course is key, is we think a key fundamental, we're trying to make the best possible contribution in the most central area possible for mm -hmm. all those things to take place. Fathers raising great sons so mm -hmm. that they're the strong link in the family and not the weak link that's going to break it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Where can dads that are interested in this find the course or women who want to introduce it to their husbands? Uh, well, they can both view the trailer and they can actually work their way through the first module all for free. And the website, I hope, is an easy one. It's My Forge, you know, the forge, like where the, the blacksmith is is uh, beating, tapping on the horseshoe to get it into shape. Myforge.org. M-Y-F-O-R-G-E dot O-R-G, myforge.org. There you can see the whole trailer and you can dip into, no, you can totally absorb the first module for free and get to, to see it. Yeah. Well, really, that's really cool. I'll put it in the description too so people can check it out there. Great. And thank you so much for just coming on the podcast today and sharing about this. I really glad that we got a chance to expand more on that of why the marriage is so important and why the children need the marriage of their parents of their biological parents so yeah, yeah well let, <laughs> let me close out with a declarative statement marriage is the single most important relationship in existence other than your relationship to god but all of human society rests on marriage there is no more important relationship on earth well, thank you. And just thank you for coming back on the show today. God bless. Thanks a million, uh, Colleen. And to all of our listeners, please like, subscribe, share with your friends, leave us a review, and keep on living the culture of life. God bless. <laughs>